So Dr. Wen, uh, thanks for coming. Um, we want you to take off your ER doc hat, put on your public health hat and help us understand uh, some stuff that's going on. First of all, I was wondering if you could give us sort of from your public health perspective, where are we in the United States? Um, how much virus is out there? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Give us an overview from your point of view. Yeah, well, unfortunately, I don't have good news in this regard because we are not in a good place. The US, we are 4% of the world's population, but we are somewhere between 20 to 25% of all the infections in the world and all the deaths in the world as well. And I think the worst part of all of this is that it didn't have to be this way. When we look at what should have happened, we had a chance back in February of actually containing this virus. If we had the testing, contact tracing, quarantining, isolation, we would have been able to test, find every case that is coming into, into the US and stop the infection in the way that South Korea did. South Korea had the very first case of COVID-19 diagnosed in their country that we did in the US. And look at where they are now with something like 300 um, deaths compared to our 160,000 deaths. Then we had another opportunity. We ended up going to this containment, um, going from containment to mitigation, and we um, locked down supposedly with the idea of suppressing the level of virus low enough that we could then develop the testing contact tracing high enough that we could rein in the infection once again. And unfortunately, we squandered that time as well. Half of the states didn't impose shelter in place orders. Um, many places did and many students didn't go to school and people lost their jobs, but we didn't use that time wisely. We reopened against a, a surge of cases of rising infections in many of our states. And we still don't have nearly the testing contact tracing that we really need. And so unfortunately, we are having a situation now where there are hot spots across many of our states. We have barely averted catastrophe in some of these Sunbelt states, only to see many other states now in the Midwest beginning to spike upwards. And I'm afraid that these waves of infections here in the US will continue unless we take much more dramatic action than we have. What is the argument, the sort of the Swedish model or the just let it go, like just let this thing go. What does a healthcare system look like if you let this virus with an R naught of around four and a low mortality rate overall, but still, you know, significantly higher than flu? What does it look like in a healthcare system if you just say, let it go, let's get herd immunity? Yeah, I think that we have already seen what that could look like. We've already seen New York getting hit so hard in the beginning. Um, we've seen Texas, Florida, Arizona, and also not just in these um, big states that we're talking about, many smaller communities that have much less healthcare infrastructure have already gotten hit. But we haven't seen how bad it could get because thankfully we intervened. In the case of New York, the shelter in place orders was able to, we were able to avert the worst of what could have happened with hospitals becoming so overwhelmed that we as ER docs and others would be put into the untenable and unthinkable position of deciding who could get that last ventilator. And that's what it could look like. And I think you also have to consider too, what is it for? As in, in this case, we don't know that we could actually get to herd immunity because we don't know how long immunity will last. So even if we could somehow get to that level of herd immunity where 60 to 80% of the population have it and therefore it protects everybody else in the community, we're talking about what, 300 million people, if it's 330 million people in America, we could be having 200, and 200 million, let's say, people who are infected before we get to that point of having herd immunity. And if you have a fatality rate of one in 100, I mean, we're talking 2 million people who would die as a result. And I just don't think that that's a reasonable approach for us to be taking when there are actually much better steps that we could take and that we've seen many Asian countries, European countries, we've seen Australia, New Zealand, they've been able to do this. We can too. So um, I just wanted to sort of have you state that because I think some people that watch the show are not physicians and who don't get it. Um, so this idea that just letting it go somehow will magically save the economy you can't have an economy with a collapsed healthcare system. We've seen that in Central and South America. So I just wanted an expert to take us through that. So 
if we, New Zealand hasn't had any community spread now for over a hundred days. Um, just a remarkable job that they've done. How do we, if I make you in charge tomorrow, I make you president and you have all the powers that you need to run the public health of the United States, what would you do now to take us to where New Zealand is? Yeah, I mean, there actually is something that we can do. I'm not sure, given the current politics and where we've gotten in this country where public health has become so polarized and political, I'm not sure that we can literally achieve this, but you know, I'm an optimist. I think that we can if we just had our collective national will. Because when you look at countries like New Zealand, it's not as if they have something that we don't. It's not like they have a vaccine and we don't have access to it. And it's not like they've developed a secret treatment that nobody is able to get. They have the same things at their disposal. We know that this is a virus that's very contagious, that's easily transmitted from person to person, but it requires people in order to be infectious. And so what we did, what we attempted to do in the lockdown, what other countries have done is to separate individuals. And so if everybody stays within their households, then all those people who are currently infected would only be able to spread it to their household. So we should be able to treat all those individuals who need treatment. But then technically, or essentially, it would stop at that point and not transmit further. So we could issue a lockdown, let's say, for four to six weeks here in the US. And we could, in theory, eliminate COVID-19 entirely, or at least suppress it to such a low level that the amount of testing, contact tracing that we have available right now would be sufficient. Now, this is what other countries have done. And by the way, they also reopen very carefully, which is important too, because I think here in the US, we've seen reopening as an on-off switch that one day everything's shut down, and then another day people who have understandably experienced quarantine fatigue are now going out there and doing all the things they were before. Actually, we should be seeing reopening as a dial that you carefully dial up the or dial back the restrictions and then you carefully dial it up again once you see that um, if cases are going in the wrong direction. So we can actually do this, but it's a matter of political will and really emphasizing that this is a public health problem that should be driven through a public health response, that politics have no role in it. So let's talk about reopening then. There's uh, lots of states that are talking about reopening schools, both you know, high schools, middle schools, universities. What are the public health requirements to do that safely? Politics aside, what's from a science point of view, what are the data points you need to have in order to do that? Yeah, the single most important determinant of whether schools are able to reopen safely is the level of spread in that community. You can imagine, let's just do the math. If you have a community where the rate of infection is one in a hundred and you have a school of a thousand people, that means on day one, you could be reopening schools and there'll be 10 people who have the infection, but don't know that they have it and are actively spreading it to others. And in fact, we've seen already that in schools that have reopened against this backdrop of surging cases in Georgia and Texas and other places that they've had to shut down really rapidly because these few cases become outbreaks very quickly, especially when we don't have the surveillance testing that we need to rein in the infection. So we absolutely need to have the level of infection at a low enough place. Now, there are parts of the country where they do have a low enough level of virus, and in these places, they can theoretically safely reopen as long as they also increase their public health infrastructure or improve their infrastructure in other ways. So, for example, de-densifying classrooms, making sure that there's six-foot distance between, um, between desks, and that may include staggering opening times, um, that may include also having different bus routes, that may include hiring different teachers and allowing some teachers and some students to do virtual learning or hybrid learning. That also includes having cleaning procedures in place and having PPE available, because why should PPE only be available to those of us who are healthcare pr providers? It should also be available to, um, to teachers and to other staff in these schools too. So to do all of this is going to be expensive. It'll take new resources, it'll take new staff. And I hope that that's what our politicians can be focused on. Instead of these arguments justifying reopening where they shouldn't be reopened, why don't we instead focus our energy on how do we make schools safer? 
how do we invest the resources so that it protects not only the students, but also really importantly, the teachers, the staff and their family members too. So I don't know if there is an answer to this. Um, the arguments against doing this the right way are social, political, but also financial. Is there modeling out there that has looked at this for prior outbreaks and that have said, if you do this right, if you do this aggressively, if you shut things down, you'll be able to reopen um, faster and economically it is better or worse. Is there any sort of modeling about which is the best way? Because we look like we're in a place where we are going to open and then close, open and then close. And this could go on for months and months and months in South Korea and New Zealand. They're open. Yeah, I mean, I think we are seeing this kind of modeling, if you will, happen in real time, that the countries that were able to reopen because they closed down efficiently the first time, that yes, there was a lot of short term pain, but that medium term to I would assume also longer term as well, that their economies rebounded a lot faster. I mean, we just can't have a functioning economy, Mel, when we when people are too scared to go to the grocery store, when consumer confidence is low because they're not going to want to go retail shopping. I mean, who wants to go shopping when they're looking outside and they know that patients with heart attacks and strokes can't even get in, into, into the hospital? I mean, that just is not going to happen. And so I think part of what's gone wrong in this country is that we've pitted the public health as an entity against the economy. And somehow people have been saying, putting this as, well, do you believe in public health or do you, do you believe in the economy? That's not the right question at all. In fact, public health is the roadmap to reopening. Public health is the roadmap to reopening schools. And I hope that we can also think about our values in all of this too. You asked earlier about reopening schools and there actually is a path to reopening schools safely and that's suppressing the level of infection. And so maybe we should be thinking about, do we want our bars to be open or do we want schools to reopen? If schools are truly so essential, as I believe that they are as a parent and, um, and as someone who used to run school health in, in Baltimore, I absolutely believe that kids belong in school. But if that's the case, then we need to decide about our trade-offs. We should be looking at coronavirus in the same way that we look at a city's budget. A city can't just have endless budget. You have to decide what are your priorities. Do you invest in housing, policing, education, health, et cetera? And in this case, if our priority is schools and children, then we should be also deciding which are the businesses that need to be kept closed in the meantime. While we support small businesses and employees and keep people whole, but we also have to make these difficult trade-offs because we cannot have our cake and eat it too. Lastly, I wanted to ask you because I am know nothing really more than any general doc about vaccines and how they're made and how quickly they can be dispersed and how effective they may or may not be. Can you give us any more expertise on what you think is likely to happen with a vaccine, whether this is the magic thing or whether it is a combination of vaccine and still significant public health interventions? Yeah, it is going to be both. Um, I hold out hope for a vaccine. I think that this there are such extraordinary efforts with so many candidates now in the pipeline that will have multiple shots on goal. And I think there has been extraordinary investment also in the vaccine process. And so there um, is a lot of funding, for example, on producing the vaccine even before um, all the trials, all the phase three trials have gone through so that production can be ramped up quickly if one of these candidates does turn out to be effective. So I'm optimistic that we will get a, um, get, get a vaccine. But first, it may take well until the end of the year, early next year for phase three trials to be complete. It's also going to take much more time for us to ramp up production and distribution because ultimately it's not the vaccine that saves a life, it's the vaccination. We have to get the vaccine into people. Also, this vaccine is almost certainly not going to be anywhere close to 100% effective. I think we'll be happy if it's 60 to 70% effective, um, which is more effective than the flu vaccine. Um, and it may be something that people need to get multiple doses of. Maybe they need to get a booster shot. Maybe they need to get this every year regularly as we do it with the flu vaccine. So all this is to say, this is not going to be the silver bullet. And we still are going to have to be really vigilant when it comes to these other um, public health practices. And I also think that we cannot wait until we have a vaccine when all these preventable infections and deaths are occurring. We should not be saying when and if we get a vaccine, everything's going to be fine because there are things that we can do right now. And we are talking about not only our economy, but also fellow American lives. 
I mean, in the time that you and I have been speaking already, we're talking about five, six people who would have died from coronavirus here in the US. That's all I've got. Do you have anything that uh, you want to talk about that I haven't touched on? I mean, I think only to appreciate the incredible work that frontline providers have been doing. Um, ER docs, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, techs, respiratory therapists, EMTs, paramedics. I mean, I'm forgetting so many others, but I think it's just been extraordinary to see the sacrifices that, um, that they have made and are continuing to make and the extraordinary work that they're all doing in this extremely challenging and ever-changing uncertain time. Yeah, and I think uh, we all would second that. And I'd also like to thank you for the work that you've been doing. Um, you're on television a lot, you're trying to get the message through. And I know that all um, people like you, Dr. Fauci, have been getting death threats and just ridiculous things for speaking the truth. So thank you for the work that you've been doing. It's extraordinarily important. And thanks for spending the time to come and speak to us. We're really proud of you as an ER doc and as a public health doc. So thanks for everything you're doing. Thank you very much.